June 6, 2023, began like any other day for Maria Luisa Manriquez. She rose at 6 a.m., prepared her two children for school, and together they climbed into their SUV. Upon arriving at the school in the Las Brisas neighborhood of Tijuana, Baja, California, Maria Luisa bid her children farewell with a kiss and a big hug before heading home to start her workday. However, for the rest of the day, no one heard from her. Maria Luisa was a well-known model and businesswoman. It was unlike her not to be in contact while working. As the hours passed, concerns from those around her only grew. Her relatives filed a missing person report at the local police station and flooded social media with her photograph. By 5 p.m. that day, the whole of Mexico was anxious to learn what had happened to the renowned beauty queen. The police arrived at Maria Luisa's home, situated in Casablanca Alley in the Guanajuato neighborhood. They were initially relieved to find the front door intact, suggesting no forced entry. However, their relief quickly turned to shock when they discovered Maria Luisa's body in a hidden room of the house, bearing clear signs of violence, including bruises and stab wounds. As the officers began to investigate this appalling crime, nearby, the burnt remnants of Maria Luisa's car were being cleared, with a person still inside the vehicle. Maria Luisa Manrique Sanguiano was born on April 1, 1979, in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. From a young age, she dreamed of entering the fashion world. She was incredibly charismatic, beautiful, and intelligent. Everyone who knew her believed she was destined for success. But Maria didn't just want to feature in magazines and wear runway clothes. She aspired to be the ultimate beauty queen. In the 1990s, Maria Luisa relocated to Tijuana, Baja California, where she secured her initial job opportunities. It was here that she discovered her true calling extended beyond modeling to encompass the business realm. Excited by the prospect of establishing her own brand, she leveraged her fashion industry connections to launch Estilo in 1997, an agency specializing in advertising and event management. Her career trajectory took a significant upturn shortly thereafter. In 1998, Maria Luisa won the Senorita Fiestas Patrias beauty pageant, marking her first major public recognition. This victory not only thrust her into the limelight, but also paved the way for her to become a leading figure in the Mexican modeling industry. Her newfound fame attracted numerous magazine cover features and a flood of job offers allowing her to accumulate both significant wealth and widespread acclaim. In 2000, Maria Luisa decided to give back to the world. She initiated various projects to support needy communities, collaborated with shelters, orphanages, and housing for the homeless. Despite becoming a fierce beauty pageant competitor, she never stopped working. She was part of Tijuana's tourism, and Convention Committee and Simenza Hospital. By 2020, Maria Luisa was nationally recognized as a philanthropist, model, and business administrator. In addition to her original agency, she began working at Modelos Expos and collaborating with entrepreneurs in Tijuana and Cotuco. Tijuana proved that beyond pretty faces, women can be significant entrepreneurs. In 2021, she won the crown of state queen of Baja, California in the Diamante category. This was followed by two more successes. In 2022, she won the Mrs. Tourism Mexico Award and traveled to the Dominican Republic, where she was crowned International Marine Beauty. Although from the outside, Maria Luisa appeared to have a controlled and enviable life, behind closed doors, it was quite different. Her personal life was kept far from the public eye. Little was known except that she adored her two young sons, Jose Alberto and Jose Luis, and often posted videos with them on her Instagram account. She never spoke about their father, not even in interviews. In 2012, Maria Luisa had been married for some time to Carlos Gomez Ibarra, a seemingly unassuming man. 
She was the primary caregiver for their two children, and to outsiders, their life seemed calm. In truth, their home life was turbulent and frightening due to Carlos's extreme physical and emotional violence. The couple often fought, with Carlos regularly resorting to hitting her. Concerned friends and family urged Maria Luisa to take action, fearing Carlos might do something even worse. In response, she filed a domestic violence complaint, but unfortunately, it resulted in no substantial legal repercussions. The marriage continued without legal intervention to protect Maria Luisa until she decided she had enough and began divorce proceedings. Carlos reacted with his typical fury to the news, but Maria Luisa was resolute, choosing to focus on rebuilding her life and looking forward to a future without him. By 2023, the model was enjoying her days going out with friends, having lunch with her girlfriends, and participating in her children's school activities. She also maintained her faith, attending church every morning. In February of that year, she appeared on the cover of a major magazine under the title The Queen and the subtitle The Most Fashionable, with a feature detailing her significance as a model and entrepreneur. Life seemed relatively well for her. On May 30th, she experienced a liberating moment as she signed her divorce papers from Carlos. On June 6th, Maria Luisa made a post on her Instagram account. It was a picture of Wednesday Adams from The Adams Family. With the overlaid text, If I'm strong, with all the things they've done to me, I must be immortal. The caption read, I've learned that every moment has its value, just like the people who were part of them. You must learn and understand that this is how people are. You can only love them as they are and look after your mental and spiritual peace. This post hinted at her tough experiences, but suggested that what she had endured had only made her stronger. Unbeknownst to anyone, this would be her last post. Later that day, as was her routine, she dropped her two children off at school in the Las Brisas neighborhood of Tijuana, Baja California, at 7 a.m., after bidding them goodbye with a kiss and a strong hug, promising to pick them up later, she greeted other parents with her characteristic charisma, got into her car, and returned home, ready to start her work day. Hours later, she stopped responding to her phone. Friends, family, and colleagues tried to reach her, but to no avail. Concerned, they went to the police station to report her missing. That afternoon, her acquaintances shared a missing person alert on social media, stating they had not heard from her since 7 a.m. that day and urging anyone with information about her whereabouts to contact them to aid the search. At 5 p.m., the police were granted permission to enter Maria Luisa's residence, located in Casablanca Alley, in the Guanajuato neighborhood. At first glance, the inside of the property appeared completely normal. Everything was orderly, with no signs of forced entry. The officers checked each room, finding nothing until they reached an unused bathroom with a dusty jacuzzi. There, shockingly, lay the lifeless body of Maria Luisa. The worst was yet to be discovered. The detectives quickly noticed she had clear signs of violence. Having been beaten and stabbed, the state prosecutor's office quickly informed the family of the deceased who went to the property to identify the body. Her face was unmistakably hers. There were no doubts about her identity. The severe injuries found on the model's body led forensic experts to conclude that this was not a case of suicide. They also determined that the time of death was around 7.30 a.m. Curiously, Around the same time, and not far from the scene, a horrific accident occurred at 8.01 a.m. A vehicle had crashed into a wall on Via Rapida Oriente and caught fire. The driver was declared dead at the scene due to severe burns, making it impossible to identify him by physical features or clothing until forensic tests could be conducted. 
Meanwhile, as the police investigation into Maria Luisa's murder began, detectives noted the absence of Carlos, her ex-husband. The news of the model's murder shocked the entire Mexican community. Maria Luisa was beloved nationwide for her charisma and philanthropic efforts. There was a clamor for thorough investigations to find her killer or killers. Her family also posted a message on her official account urging people to remember her for all the good she had done and the people she had helped. Just hours after her body was discovered, the Baja California State Prosecutor's Office held a press conference announcing a significant breakthrough in the investigation. They had identified a suspect. Surveillance footage from the street showed a man arriving at Maria Luisa's home around 7.30 a.m. This man was none other than Carlos Gomez Ibarra. After parking his bicycle at the entrance, Carlos entered through the front door without any signs of forced entry. Inside, he brutally attacked his ex-wife with a stabbing weapon leading to her death. He then hid her body in the most secluded room of the house, the old jacuzzi room, clumsily covering it with various items and clothes in a poor attempt to conceal it. Merely 15 minutes later, as if completing a routine errand, Carlos left the building and loaded his bicycle onto a black Ford F-150 pickup truck parked at the entrance, which was registered in the model's name. He fled the scene cowardly. However, minutes after leaving Maria Luisa's house, Carlos began to feel overwhelming guilt. The anxiety escalated to the point where, while driving, he decided to call one of his stepsons. I'm a bad father, was all the young man heard before Carlos hung up, not wanting to hear a response, only seeking to alleviate his torment. It wasn't enough. Within seconds, he called another relative, implying he wanted to apologize for something he had done, claiming remorse, but not elaborating further. He then drove to Simon Bolivar Boulevard and onto Via Rapida Oriente in the third stage of the Rio Tijuana. Growing increasingly nervous, he exceeded the speed limit and, fully resigned to his fate, Carlos accelerated until he crashed into a pedestrian bridge pillar in front of the Quia car dealership. The vehicle burst into flames, and Carlos died, burned beyond recognition. It was 8 a.m. when the Tijuana Fire Department reported the incident. Initially, police on the scene thought the crash was an accident, but the escalating speed suggested it might have been intentional. After forensic confirmation that the deceased was indeed the woman's ex-husband, a strong theory emerged. He had committed suicide. Ultimately, the crash was deemed intentional. That afternoon, Carlos had committed two acts, the vehicular crash and, far more critically, the murder of the model. The victim's family strongly supported the theory that Carlos was the primary suspect in the murder, citing his past violent behavior towards her and a previous complaint filed against him. The fact that the crashed vehicle was registered in the model's name only reinforced the theory that Carlos had stolen it that day to flee the scene. The fire department's call at 8 a.m. and the body's discovery at 5 p.m. fit the timeline perfectly. The fact that they had signed the divorce papers the day before further supported the family's view of Carlos as a violent man reacting poorly to his ex-wife's actions. The Baja California State Prosecutor's Office held a press conference revealing the intricate details of their investigation. There was no doubt Carlos Gomez was the sole suspect in the murder of Maria Luisa. However, the case was far from straightforward. The Attorney General of Baja California, Ivan Carpio Sanchez, pointed out that the case needed further review as there were no concrete proofs. The complaint Maria Luisa had filed nearly three years earlier testified to Carlos's violent nature, capable of horrendous acts. The fact that this complaint was overlooked and is even now questioned demonstrates that the authorities often turn a blind eye when called upon for help. 
the Federal Penal Code stipulates that a murder qualifies as femicide when a woman is killed on the basis of her gender. Several factors are considered in determining this, including whether there are degrading injuries or mutilations, a history of violence in the family, workplace or school by the perpetrator against the victim, and whether there was an intimate, affectionate or trusting relationship between the killer and the victim. All these elements were present in the crime against Maria Luisa, which is why it is imperative that this event is recognized not as a crime of passion, but as the femicide it was. Had the system designed to protect women acted when she sought help, she might still be alive. Now all that remains is sorrow and desolation for her family. Her two children, aged 15 and 17, are left orphaned. The elder has vowed to care for the younger, but this is not enough. They need their mother. It is vital to remember such cases to foster societal awareness, encouraging women to seek help. Yet all this is meaningless if the authorities they turn to for protection choose to ignore them. Maria Luisa's case gained media attention primarily because she was a well-known model and businesswoman throughout Mexico and nearby countries. But cases like hers occur daily and the stories of these women rarely reach the mainstream media. In January 2023 alone, there were 228 reported femicides in Mexico, 128 in February, and another 228 in March, marking a 7% increase from the previous year. However, the violence and number of women murdered extend to an additional 674 cases categorized as malicious homicide, meaning that, like in the model's case, hundreds of cases are classified differently to manipulate the real numbers. This would not happen if the state were not complicit. In this particular instance, no trial can be held to convict the criminal since he took his own life but it is still possible to keep the public informed, to fight for the safety of millions of women who face daily violence, and to help them before it is too late. Once again, dear audience, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for taking the time to learn about yet another case from this channel. If you haven't yet subscribed, I warmly invite you to do so and join this great community.